This episode of The Lou Rockwell Show is sponsored by... Do you want liberty in your lifetime? The Free State Project is our best chance. We are people who know that liberty will not be achieved by more of the same tactics and are committed to a strategy that will work. Check us out on the web at freestateproject.org. That's freestateproject.org. This is The Lou Rockwell Show. Well, how wonderful to have as our guest this morning, Mr. Peter Schiff. Peter is president of Euro-Pacific Capital. He's the author most recently of the little book of Bull Moves and Bear Markets. He's the great teacher of Austrian business cycle theory and uh, the great predictor of the housing bust and so many other things. And Peter, recently I've heard a lot of talk from Wall Street people about the greatness of Bernanke and how he can and should be reappointed to the Fed because, after all, he prevented the world economy from going off a cliff. Yeah, well, I would much prefer it if he was being vilified by Wall Street. You know, uh, he's popular on Wall Street because he saved Wall Street. He saved their bonuses and their cushy jobs, uh, but at the expense of everybody else. I mean, I would prefer a, a Fed chairman like uh, Paul Volcker who everybody hated, who everybody wanted impeached. <laughs> you know, not somebody who's, uh, you know, the favorite and the life of the party. No, and I can remember when Paul Volcker actually cut the money supply. I mean, he didn't, didn't just cut the rate, the rate of increase. He actually cut it and stopped the inflation and set the stage for some actual growth. But no more Paul Volcker's. Yeah, I mean, the way you knew Volcker was doing the right thing is he was universally despised. Everybody on both the Republicans and the Democratic side uh, you know, wanted him uh, to resign. The only one, the only support he had was was Ronald Reagan, and that was probably one of the best things that Reagan did was uh, you know support Paul Volcker's independence and and support his decision. No, and of course it was actually Jimmy Carter who appointed him. So it was even though Carter had made the mistake of appointing G. William Miller, who was sort of a boob, as I remember. And then we had times in those days, in the seventies, when there were actually people in Europe not wanting to accept dollars in hand-to-hand transactions. And that's when, I guess, the establishment decided they better bring in Volcker to fix things. Yeah, well, that's already happening around the world, and it is going to happen again. I mean, you know, you've got a consensus, uh, you know, among most of the world's savvy investors, including, you know, Warren Buffett here and and Bill Gross, uh, that the dollar, you know, has there's only one direction for the dollar, and that's down. Uh, However, you know, most people seem to think that it's a good thing as long as the decline is orderly. But I don't think people holding dollars around the world consider the dollar losing value orderly to be a good thing when they own them. And I think as more and more people, you know, resign themselves to the dollar's fate, they're not going to want to suffer it themselves. And no one's going to want to own a currency that is just going to decline gradually over time. Why would, why would they? Peter, is it a surprise that so many of the dollars, the trillions of dollars that – uh, Mr. Bernanke and company have created, are remaining in bank reserves and are not being loaned out? Well, it doesn't shock me. I mean, you know, think about the opportunities to make loans. Uh, who, what are they going to loan to? I mean, the average American is already uh, overly indebted and can barely pay back the money he's already borrowed. So does it make sense for banks to make new loans uh, to over-leverage consumers? As far as businesses are concerned, uh, most American businesses are relatively unproductive. They're already highly leveraged. Uh, we have so much taxes and regulation in this country that it seems like lending to businesses would be very risky, especially when so many businesses are involved in the service sector and they're going to be contracting. Uh, so I don't think there's a lot of great places for businesses to loan right now. I think they're more interested in trying to re, re, you know, recapitalize their balance sheets because of all the losses on the loans that they've already made. Well, Peter, it only took, what, 11 or 13, whatever the figure is, trillions of, do- of uh, dollars in new money to raise the Dow by a few thousand points. What's going to happen if the Dow you know, goes down again, or I should say when it goes down again? Yeah, well, it's going to. Look, I mean, th- there's no good news out there. I mean, look, even today, the... Uh, you know, they're saying unemployment claims unexpectedly rose. I mean, people really think that the situation has turned around. I mean, it, it hasn't turned at all. I mean, sure, we, you had to get something for trillions of dollars of bailouts and stimuluses, so we get a short-term bounce. But it's not going to last, and, and, and then the market's going to turn down again. The economy is going to turn down again, and we're going to find that we're now in even worse shape than we were before because we've compounded our problems by adding additional debt. But what does it mean if people overseas and, indeed, people in this country as well start to not to want to hold dollars? I mean, what exactly does that mean for the economy? What does it mean for the world economic situation? Well, 
ultimately it pulls the rug out from under you know the phony economy that we've been living under, which is an economy where you know we print money and exchange it for the actual production of the rest of the world, whether it's commodities or finished consumer goods. Uh, we've been getting a free ride, and that the world has to expend real resources, labor, capital, uh, to create products, and we simply run money off a printing press and, and call it an even exchange. And, you know, we can get away with that so long as people are willing to hold on to our dollars and just, you know, let them sit in the bank. But the minute they don't want them anymore because they're losing value, then uh, our ability to exchange the paper that we print for the products everybody else makes is gone. And now all of a sudden it's a different world where we can only consume to the extent that we produce and we can only borrow to the extent that we save. And when we are forced to live within our means, that is a major, major change and a major shock for our economy. Will it be a major shock to the government as well? I mean, the government, uh, which has certainly built its popularity with the, with the American people, as you say, based on ripping off the rest of the world to some extent. Yeah, I think so. And I think the, the, Amer- the American politicians are going to have to level with American people and say, look, we overpromised. Uh, we've been delivering government services and benefits and subsidies that we can't afford, and we have to uh, eliminate them. And as a result of years and years of our bad monetary and fiscal policy, our economy is such a mess right now. We've left ourselves into such a massive hole that it's not going to be easy to dig our way out of it. So we, you know, we are in so we are in uh, some serious economic trouble. It's not fatal. It's not that we can never come back. I've, I've mentioned often that countries have had their economy devastated by war, and then they come back. And I think, in in many senses, we've lost the war. It, it's not that the enemies bombed our factories, but our factories have, are gone. It's not that we've squandered our savings, you know, paying for the, the military, although in some cases we have. But our savings are gone and our factories are gone. we got to get them back, which means that, you know, we have to accept a diminished standard of living in order to get an economy that's viable recreated. You mentioned politicians are going to have to tell the truth to the American people. As far as I know, there's only one person in office so far doing that, and of course that's Ron Paul. But there's a lot of talk about maybe you joining him. What's uh, what's happening with your potential race against the man I always call Crook Dodd? Yeah, well, before I can run against uh, Dodd, I have to run and beat several Republicans who are vying for that slot. Most recently now we have another candidate who is supposedly mulling it over, but I have it on good authority that she has decided to run, and that is Linda McMahon, the wife of Vince McMahon and the CEO of the World Wrestling Federation. And apparently she's told reporters that she's willing to spend $25 million of their money on this campaign. So that's a lot of cash. That's certainly a lot more than I'm willing to spend personally. And I'm probably it's probably more than I'm going to be able to raise. So she'll be able to spend a lot of money as well as the other front people that are in the race. But I don't see how putting uh, you know the head of the World Wrestling Federation in the Senate is going to make much difference. I mean, I think that she's not a politician, and she, she's got that in her favor. But, you know, she's a promoter. And in, 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 many, case, in many ways, wrestling is a lot like politics because the whole thing is, you know, is a fraud. You know, in a wrestling match, you've got two people that are trying to kill each other in the ring, but it's all fake, and behind the scenes, they're best buddies. And that's very similar to what happens in politics, where you have the Democrats and Republicans pretending that they're, you know, mortal enemies and that they have major differences. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, they they agree on practically everything, and they're all buddy-buddy. But what we need is somebody – I think we need a non-politician. I do not think that our problems are going to be solved by politicians. The politicians created the problems. Many of them don't understand the problems, and all they will do is make them worse. I think we do need to bring in some outsiders to get some fresh ideas and some fresh perspectives and people who don't want to necessarily be in Washington. I don't think career politicians could make the difficult choices because it endangers their career. We need people who have other careers who will go to Washington and do the right thing without regard to how it's going to affect their future reelection prospects. Uh, because if, you're, if your ultimate goal is getting reelected, it's very difficult to deliver the bad news to the people that you hope will reelect you. So, and, I, and I do think that this is a major, major problem. You know, on television the other day, you know, one of the anchors asked me if, you know, isn't it true that the Fed can just step on the brakes, you know, before it's too late? And I said, you know, I think the time to step on the brakes is long past. We've just got a brace for impact right now. And right now we're not doing that. You know, we don't have anybody even understands what the impact is going to be, uh, let alone uh, bracing for it. So I think we've got to get ready, and we have to know uh, how to, you know, what we need to do to be able to rebuild the economy. And I think it's such an important thing. I think the elections of 2012 are going to be so critical 
to whether this country can survive economically or not, whether we can ever return to uh, what we used to be or even what we are now, and if we're, if we're just going to be a, a, a giant banana republic the way a lot of the countries on the other side of Central America. You know, and, and, and it very well could be that the world will look at the Americas kind of together. Maybe the only viable economy uh, will be Canada, although you never know. I mean, there's stuff going on down in, in Argentina and Brazil. I mean, maybe the fortunes of the Americas will shift and the real wealth will be on the southern part of the continent and not, and not up here. But if we really want to, to do the right thing, then we've got to change Washington, and it's got to change soon because we are running out of time. And so that's the reason that, that I would disrupt my my career and most of the other people. In fact, all the other people who are running in Connecticut are either successful businessmen who are basically now retired and looking for a new challenge or who are simply bored and just want to be in the Senate because it's an ego thing or career politicians who only know one thing, and that's how to, how to, how to get elected. I'm different in that I am still in the peak of my career. And, you know, it is certainly not a good career move for me to retire at the age of 46 from a vibrant, growing business to go to Washington. But it's something that I am willing to do based on how high I think the stakes are. And, you know, we have raised uh, quite a bit of money, you know, without even running. I'm, I'm almost at about $900,000 raised uh, on my website, shiftforsenate.com. I think I've raised more than the announced candidates, and I think if I do announce and I do you know, actual fundraisers, I haven't even done a fundraiser yet, and I have a more coordinated method, I think I can raise a lot more money. But if anybody is listening to this and they want me to run and they want me to have a, a, a good chance of winning, they should go to the website, you know, shiftforsenate.com, and contribute as much as they can. If for some reason I don't run, I'm returning all the contributions, so you know, don't have to worry about that since I'm not actually a candidate yet. But if I do become a candidate, which is very likely, I mean, it's more likely than not, you know, the more money I raise, the more bang in the media I'm going to get when I make that announcement, because money talks in, in politics and in the media, and if I've raised a a lot of money. That's going to raise a lot of eyebrows, and that's going to get me some extra coverage, and it's going to make it easier. Because in order to win this campaign, you know, you mentioned Ron Paul, and he was able to raise a lot of money, but I don't think he ran a good campaign. And part of that might have been because he knew he really couldn't win, and so I don't think he, he ran to win. I think he ran uh, to spread his message, and I think he was very successful in that, and a lot of people woke up. But I I'm running to win if I run, and so I want to make sure that I win. I want to make sure that the money that people give me is not wasted. So, And in order to have a well-run campaign, it's going to require professional campaigners, and they cost money, and i got to hire them. And I know I'm going to get a lot of volunteers, and i got to organize them, and i got to spend a lot of money on media, and i got to buy New York media to get the Fairfield County market, and it's expensive, expensive media. So it's going to be a, an expensive race. And so if people really think I can make a difference and want me there, they need to uh, make contributions themselves. I'll, I'm going to spend some of my own money, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not the, the McMahons. I don't have uh, $25 million lying around that I don't care about. Peter, tell us about the economic effects if Obama gets his terrible health care plan through. Well, I mean, the economy is already a disaster, you know, with or without the health care. So at this point, we're just talking about extra nails in our economic coffin. But it, the whole thing is absurd for the Congress and the president to fail to comprehend the gravity of the situation that we're in right now, to think that the U.S. government, which is already broke, can afford another massive government program. I mean, look at the complete failure of Medicare. I mean, Medicare is costing well over 10 times, maybe 20 times what they initially budgeted. And now they want to basically expand that program and, and make it even bigger. You know, I just got my health insurance bill to renew for my company, and the year-over-year -year increase was 18%. I mean, what else, what goes up at 18% a year? I mean, this is insanity. And this is during the biggest recession since the Great Depression, and prices are going up for health care. I mean, obviously the system is broken, but it's not because of the free market. Free markets don't raise prices like that. Free markets lower prices. There is no uh, precedent for free markets driving prices higher. I mean, if that was the case, nobody would, would, would want them. The reality is the free market is the best way to keep prices down. It's government that keeps prices rising. Anytime it gets its way into a market and distorts and interferes with the market mechanism, it destroys quality and runs prices out of control. We see it in health care. We see it in education. It's any place that government gets its tentacles. And what we've got to do is, is get, get government out of this, get the market back in so that we can bring these costs under some control. Peter Schiff, thanks so much for being with us this morning. And mention your website again. If you want to support my potential candidacy for the U.S. Senate, if you want to sign up to be a volunteer, if you want to donate money, there that, that website is shiftforsenate.com. Peter, thank you. Thanks, Luke.
You've been listening to The Lou Rockwell Show. Produced by LouRockwell.com, the best-read libertarian website in the world. If you'd like to advertise on this podcast or on the website, email advertise at LouRockwell.com. And thanks for listening.